with some credits towards the cost of excursions. Now you can traditionally buy those packages separately. And if everyone just when you're if you're not asking a question or anything directly, do just keep yourself um, on mute um, to avoid any interference issues. But welcome everyone to today's event about how to get abroad with TEFL and where TEFL can lead you. Um, welcome everybody who's doing our Global Careers Launchpad this month. Um, I hope you're all making good progress with your TEFL and with the Udemon Professional Development Programme. And if you have any questions on any of that, do feel free to um, send, me, send us an email at any time or I can hang around after this call for a chat. Um, welcome to Pass Go To Co, as I can see here as well, and everybody who's registered interest in our China Fellowship um, year-long teaching program um, as well. And welcome to everybody who's come through our, our partners, come on out, Japan, um, Sub China, Young China Watchers, um, and lt and in, in Oxford. Um, today's event is all about how to get abroad with TEFL and where TEFL can lead you. Um, even at the moment during the pandemic, TEFL really is one of the best ways that you can get abroad and can still get abroad. Um, it's one of the easiest ways after just after you've graduated to get abroad. Um, lots of countries where it's difficult to get a visa um, for, for other careers where you have to have work experience, you can get one if you have a TEFL or CELTA or TESOL um, to get abroad. So it's a really great way if you're interested in getting abroad um, to do so. Um, we have with us today Max Thompson, Claudia Loughran and Charlotte Thornton-Smith, who've all followed slightly different routes into TEFL, all went to different countries, um, and then have followed different routes since doing the TEFL. And I'm very excited to hear more about all of their stories. Um, so to kick us off, Claudia, would you like to do um, a quick introduction, perhaps covering just your background, why you got into TEFL, where you went, and, and just a brief summary of your journey up till now? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much for inviting me to be here today. Um, when I was thinking about what I was going to say, I realised that it's exactly 10 years since I did my CELTA, so it's quite a nice time to kind of reflect and take stock and, and, and think about everything that I've, that I've done. Um, so I did my CELTA in Oxford um, and my very first job was um, teaching at a summer school in Moscow and I did three weeks at a camp just outside of the city working with VIP kids and at the weekend I'd accompany my boss on meetings in the city with parents because I was using my Russian skills to help him translate um, at some of those meetings so it was really insightful uh, and then spent the rest of the summer doing a summer school back in the UK with that money I went backpacking again in in India and then went to East Asia Whilst I was in Malaysia, got a call from a Kiwi lady that I did my CELTA with offering me a job in Libya. And just like you said at the beginning, like TEFL can take you to places where you can't even get tourist visas for. And at that point, Libya was just totally off the radar. So I was like, wow, when, when am I going to get this opportunity to go to somewhere like Libya? So I jumped at the chance, then found myself back in London, getting a Libyan visa at the at the Libyan embassy, just with this business visa in my passport on my way to Tripoli within within weeks. Um, and then spent spent nearly a year in the country teaching petroleum engineering graduates on this on this wonderful program that the government had set up for these students that had um, all been students during the revolution so they were they all had their their education kind of disrupted because the universities closed down during the war and they just needed a little boost with their English and maths so we had some Egyptian teachers doing the maths and the IT and some some English teachers helping them just get their English up um, and that was that was really great um, and I was able to learn Arabic in the evening so it was um, such a special time, um, but unfortunately the security situation just went from bad to worse and all the expats had to, had to leave. Um, it was really, really difficult. Um, but I knew I wanted to stay in the Middle East and I knew I wanted to keep learning Arabic. So I um, got a job in, in Saudi teaching at an all women's university. Um, did that for a year, which was a completely different experience. It's a really different country to Libya, but managed to kind of continue my love affair with, with the Arab world there. Um, and then decided to 
to make the leap into online teaching when it was still kind of a new thing about five or six years ago, um, which I've been doing since then, uh, which has enabled me to travel to lots of countries and work remotely and to countries where you can find teaching jobs, but the salaries are so low that you'd really only do it for the love of it rather than than to make any any decent money. So it's been it's enabled me to, to travel in places like like Peru, where there's not that many that many jobs out there, although although there always are. Um, and most recently, I've I've started to do more proofreading and editing work just to try to get off offline a bit and have a bit more flexibility. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to spend the rest of the summer in in Spain doing that and developing that side of the business. Great, thank you, Claudia. That all sounds sounds like a, a lot of fun. Just just for context, quickly, what what year was it that you first went to Libya? Uh, it was twenty thirteen, so about okay. a year and a half after the revolution. Wow, that's fascinating time to go. Yeah, yeah. There was this sort of window where it was where there was a lot of investment, things were really opening up, and and things were relatively stable. And then, unfortunately, it's just gone from from bad to worse. And None of the expats that left in 2014 have come back, really. So it's really sad. Mm. Yeah. Um, Max, would you like to, to go next? OK, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, great to be here. And uh, I think I can recognize a couple of names from my summer with Go2Go in 2019. Um, so my uh, current situation is I am a, a part-time teacher and freelance content writer for um, ESL schools in China and Tokyo. Um, Tokyo is where I'm living now, that's where I am. Um, my TEFL story, I guess, began in 2014. Um, when I did a TESOL that my mum bought me on Groupon as a graduation present <laughs> um, from Brighton University. Um, but uh, pretty much the only reason I went to university is so I could use it to get a visa for China. I visited China when I was 16 as part of a school trip um, where my school was linked to a school in central China. And um, yeah, so I, as soon as uni finished, I got a job, saved up enough to pay off that uni overdraft and um, was gone by the following March. I'm one of many Teflers you'll meet who use Tefl just as a route to travel. I had no interest in teaching, um, but when I got there, I absolutely loved the, the teaching. It was like the perfect job for me. I was always a bit weird, a bit funny, a bit kind of unprofessional. And <laughs> teaching really suits that sort of um, personality type. You know, it's usually a very sort of relaxed environment at school, um, w with teaching kids at least. So I was in China for three years at a very big company, um, which was a kind of evening and weekend job. Um, these kind of big companies are great as beginners because they get you your visa and everything. Um, but then I was sort of tired of it. I thought I'm going to go back to the UK, try a British life. I think I lasted two months before I decided I got to get back to China. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sick of the UK and everyone in it. Um, uh, so I went back to China for another two years, during which time I taught uh, I was like a homeroom teacher for an international kindergarten. And then after that, I was offered a job in Wuhan in China and I was offered a job in Tokyo. And I had this difficult decision to be my, the head of my own school in Wuhan or to move to Tokyo. So both new exciting opportunities, but I decided I'm gonna go to Tokyo because I wanted to get another country under my belt before I hit 30 turned out to be the right decision. We all know what happened in Wuhan, uh, literally weeks after I'd made this decision. Um, so yeah, now I'm in Tokyo. I did a, a year of 
full-time kindergarten in Tokyo, which was how I got my visa. Um, but I left that this spring and now I'm doing sort of odd jobs around Tokyo and some um, remote online freelancing work, uh, writing for various projects and schools around Japan and uh, China. That's me. Yeah, I should add, so Max and I actually lived together in Beijing before, before we went to Tokyo and one of our other housemates made the opposite decision to Max and moved to Wuhan and I gotta say he's, he's had <laughs> yeah. slightly less good time of it over the last year. Um, yeah. Cheers Max. And actually, uh, Shard, sorry. Uh, sorry, okay, that's okay, I'll get Okay, okay. Um, Shard, would you like to go next? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for having me on this, Richard. I have to apologise um, in advance. I live on quite a busy main road in South East London, so uh, you might hear uh, the occasional uh, police car going by, but I'll try and be nice and loud. Um, so my TEFL journey started in 2013 after I graduated um, from Leeds University. Um, I did philosophy. Um, was a little bit stuck when I left, really didn't know what to do. Um, philosophy is one of those courses that was quite wide ranging and I struggled a little bit when I left. So my mum walked past, she worked by um, St George's International, um, a language centre in London. She saw a poster on the side and she said, oh Tefl, you know, what a, what a great, great way to think about things you could do. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And I did a, a month's intensive course while I was living at home uh, after graduation. Um, once I finished that was again, a little bit stuck because I had this, this, you know, this great course that I enjoyed so much, but in order to go away traveling, I had to earn some money, of course. So I um, I went into marketing. I went into marketing because, you know, that's just uh, an avenue. It was very easy. Um, wasn't very fulfilling for me, but I did earn enough money to uh, travel to um, Buenos Aires in Argentina. So I had a friend that was living there. Um, and I thought, absolutely, I, I would really enjoy learning Spanish at school. So I was like, right, I'll just I'll just go to Argentina and um spent a couple of months traveling uh, across South America. At that stage, I didn't use the TEFL. I, I actually really wanted to learn Spanish more, um, which in the long run actually really helped in terms of having some grounding with the Spanish to um to teach English as best I could. So did that for a few months. Um, permanently moved to Buenos Aires, kind of at the end of 2014. Yeah, it must have been 2014, and started looking for jobs. Um, it was it was relatively easy to find a couple of jobs in adults um, working with adults. Um, you know, teaching them English. It would be evening courses. I would do some in the morning, um, and I, I really enjoyed it. But I had done some work well mostly mostly babysitting and I love kids so I was like right I really want to use this now it's an opportunity to um to go and see if I can if I can teach English and through someone it was sort of a, a, a series of events that someone I was teaching their child's school this kindergarten in Buenos Aires they were looking for uh, an English support teacher so I grabbed grabbed the chance to do that and for the last six months of my time in Argentina, I was an English support teacher um, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I just had the best time with the kids and just the kind of, you know, the love and support you get from little kids. And they were so excited. I mean, they all thought I knew the Queen, which was probably one of the funniest things ever. We really enjoyed rising them up about that. But um, yeah, and then last month before I was, I knew I was gonna be coming back from Argentina. I sort of knew that my time there was was, a, was gonna be about a year, but I decided to sign up um, for a PTC course, uh, postgraduate certificate of education to become a, a primary school teacher. So luckily time really worked out for me. I managed to get onto a course in um, uh, University of Roehampton in London uh, to start that September. And the TEFL experience I had, um, really did really, really help me. Um, that experience for that extended period of time, not, not being you know, a qualified teacher, but having that hands-on experience um, meant that I was, I was able to, along with a two week um, uh, experience in a London school, uh, I got into the PGC course. Um, and yeah, I mean, the rest is history. I, I trained for a year between 2000 and would have been 2004, 15 to 16 yeah the whole year and I've been a primary school teacher ever since and um I was made maths lead of my um primary school last year and I got some exciting news this year that I'm going to be um, mentoring newly qualified teachers um next year so being an NQT mentor 
which is really exciting um, and it sounds very corny but without the TEFL I genuinely wouldn't have I don't think I would have it was a series of events that allowed me to discover what I really wanted to do and I'm, I'm very very happy now in my career so that is my TEFL story. Thanks, Shai. I think a lot of us and uh, I know a lot of the, the students doing our program can really relate to that feeling of not knowing what you're wanting to do after you graduate, kind of taking whatever job you happen to get from the many you might have applied to, but without really knowing why. And it's, it's really inspiring to hear how going abroad and, and getting a TEFL and just trying something different can lead to, to really finding what your vocation is in life. Um, so before we go into what the actual experience of going abroad was like, I know a lot of people in, in their questions before the event were asking um, how, to actually, how you all actually went about getting your, your TEFL, CELTA or, or TESLs um, and how you went about finding the um, jobs that you ended up doing, particularly when you initially went abroad. I know you've all just touched um, briefly on, on how you did that, but do you have any, A, how did you do your TEFL and how, how, and how did you find the jobs that, that you did find? Do you, and do you have any tips um, for good places to look for, for jobs abroad? Um, and B, do you have anything that you wish you'd known at the start of your process of doing the TEFL and finding the jobs, which you only realized later or worked out later um, that you could share with everyone? Perhaps Max, would you, could you go first on that? Okay, hello again, everyone. Um, so like I mentioned in my intro, I my first TEFL was a, sort of Groupon deal, and it was only online. And there was no face-to-face -face element or no sort of extra interesting trainings like, like this one. Um, so it, it was very basic, but the, the company that I ended up moving to China with was a company that I worked with in Brighton as a tour guide. Um, and this is a company that I'm not gonna shout out the name, because I'm not hugely a fan of them. But um, if you live in any coastal town, you will see staff members of this company in pink t-shirts with hundreds of Italian students. Um, but they, uh, the, because it's such a big company that I moved to China with, it was quite painless um, because they had like an entire department dedicated to international recruitment. Um, so if you're concerned about like visa processes and sort of um, guarantees, I would recommend going through one of the bigger companies. Um, but something I wish I learned or realized sooner once I did get to China is that once you're in the country, the smaller privately owned businesses tend to be a lot better in terms of the work environment, the workload, the sort of personal support you get, and the pay. Um, I stayed at that big company for three years, um, which I, I really regret. I could have expanded and kind of moved into different areas a lot easier if I'd, if I'd gone to a smaller, maybe a kind of more startup TEFL company in China. Um, in terms of things I wish I'd known from the beginning, I can only speak for China in this, but the visa process is a hassle and it does take months and there will be deadlines that are missed and pushed back. Um, and that's just the nature of the bureaucracy um, involved with getting into China. Um, again, with the smaller schools, they might ask you to come in on a tourist visa and then they'll convert it once you get into China. That was something I wasn't comfortable with the first time round, um, and I can understand why people may not be. Um, you know, so again, a bigger company, you're guaranteed the, the Z visa, I think it was, but it does take a long time. There's a lot of, you know, I think I had to go to a lawyer to get my university degree co-signed. I had to get a police criminal background check. There, there's a lot to get through, but then once you're there, it's, you know, it's, it's done and dusted sort of. Um, yeah, just go, basically. I mean, I'm sure Charlotte would agree with her like marketing job that you got straight out of uni. 
any first job you get out of uni is going to be stressful and weird and difficult. You know, it may as well be in, <laughs> in Beijing or, or somewhere interesting, <laughs> you know, it's going to be stressful regardless. You just need to work through that and then you'll land on your feet. Yeah, but I definitely agree with that. And it, it's interesting what you say about um, China with it being better to go and work in, in some of the smaller schools, because that's for, for people who've applied to join our China fellowship program. That's something we put quite a, a lot of emphasis on. What we're trying to do there is to, to find you jobs in those smaller schools where you have better conditions, you have a better experience. But by being part of our program, you're, you're part of a cohort and you actually have that community. Because one of the problems if, if you find a, a smaller school to go and join abroad is that perhaps you can't find the, you don't have as many immediate friends, you don't have as many people in the same position as you, so it can be slightly lonely. So that's uh, what we're trying to combat by matching you with those smaller schools, but then giving you the, the community as well. Um, but Shah, so you, you obviously, traveled to, to Argentina first before before finding the job. Um, how did you find the process of, of doing the TEFL and then how easy was it to find work once you were in the country? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I hadn't really reflected on it. I, I would say mine was less, um, yeah, Argentina aren't known for their kind of uh, strict admin uh, policies. So I would say that probably one of my biggest struggles with particularly in South America was the kind of more lax, uh, lax approach to things. Um, you know, there wasn't any, I mean, I, there were offers after I finished the TAFL of joining companies, but I remember thinking to myself, oh, I just, I want to travel, I want to do it. I'm quite a quite an, a, a ferociously independent person. So I was like, no, 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 I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it on my own. Um, looking back, you know, using what the course could have got me probably would have allowed for a bit more security. That's not to say that I, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was totally lacking in security when I was in Buenos Aires, but it was kind of, you had to be quite proactive. Like certainly I sort of held on to my TAFA certificate, like it was, you know, like pure gold and, you know, it was it was great the opportunities that I got but you know doing a couple of evening courses here and there I sort of almost had to go door to door to, to different um, schools which was great because you know you have that TEFL it is it is a little bit like it is a bit like gold they go oh my goodness that's you know you're a certified English teacher I think regardless of what type of course you do so yeah if if I could sort of maybe go back I well no I, I wouldn't because I had an amazing time and but it was the process was you had to do a lot on your own and I was part of like several different schools so fingers in many pies, so to speak, but didn't necessarily have that, like they wouldn't provide me with a visa or anything. Um, so I don't know whether that's, that's probably the, the continent, the, the place I traveled to rather than, than the TEFL itself. I know the TEFL would, you know, if I'd got into bigger companies that it would have offered me that, but like I said, a bit ferociously independent. So I kind of like just did it, did it on my own. And, and actually maybe the kind of more you know, um, spread across is how I ended up meeting that man whose daughter was in the school. And it was it was quite uh, serendipitous, you know, certain people that I knew. But um, I met I met lots of people that that were in a very similar position. I think lots of the English teachers in, in Argentina, it was kind of like, oh, I do a I do evening course there. I do a morning course there. So um, that was probably one of the challenges. But I think I'm only thinking about that in hindsight. At the time, I found it all quite exciting. Um, I was I was young. Um, I'm not sure if I'd do it all over again, but um, yeah, bigger companies probably would have provided more, um, slightly more security. I was thinking, thinking about it. Yeah, it's good to hear though that you can in, in Argentina just turn up and find work. So I know in China it's not, I mean, you could go as a tourist, find work, but then you'd have to go back, do the work visa process um, before you could actually start teaching legally. Um, so it's good to hear that you can can do it that way. Claudia, you, you've, you've obviously worked in a, a few different countries. You now mainly do it online. Um, do you have any kind of tips for people in, in, in how to get started uh, from your experience? Um, yeah, the, the, the sort of in-person jobs that I've done have been a mix of, of through contacts and just finding them on, on tefl.com, which I believe still exists, and they have a, a jobs board there and a lot of people advertise through there but as as the guy said um a lot of jobs are not advertised and you just find them once you're in in country so once I was in Libya I actually got offered an interview at the British Council there for a local contract job which I was offered and and turned down because the 
when you work for the British Council, you're quite restricted as to as to where you can travel within the country because you have to follow the FCO regulations for that country, which I wasn't prepared to do. So I um, and they had like a safe house and, and you had to be home by eight o'clock. And that wasn't really part of the way I live my life in Tripoli. So I didn't didn't want to do that. But but just having the, the opportunity to have an interview at the British Council, I wouldn't have had if I hadn't already been in Tripoli. So these things come up and you just have to like, you know, be proactive and, and, and take those opportunities as they come. Um, but there's lot, there's always platforms advertising on, on tefl.com and, and, and different ways you can apply um, for various jobs. Um, I like to echo what, what uh, the guys said about different visas. I mean, of course, there are some countries like China and Russia that you've, you've got to be invited um, to to get into. But you've, you, you have got to ask questions about what kind of visa you'll be on. Lots of I was lucky to be on a, on a work visa in Saudi, but lots of my colleagues were not on, on work permits and were actually not allowed to leave the country during the course of the, the contract and felt very trapped there. So, so whereas I was able to go on holiday um, during the half term break, they weren't, they just had to stay there, um, which is just a really awful position to be in if you don't know that that's gonna be the case before you sign up. So just asking those questions is really important to know what, what limitations there are, but your, your employer may not tell you that. So you're finding someone that's been to the country and asking them what questions to ask, really important. So Max, do you want to jump in there? Sorry, just to piggyback off that, um, that's a very important point about the asking questions. Um, and if at all possible, try and figure out where on the internet the expats of the place you're moving to kind of chat, be it a Reddit page or, you know, um, if you're thinking about China, download WeChat and try to get into some WeChat groups of expats in the city that you're going to, because you're going to find much more legitimate answers than the companies will give you. Um, and reviews, I think Glassdoor can be quite good. Of course, things like Glassdoor, they tend to lean towards the negative because you're just more likely to post a review if you're angry than if you're happy. But um, it's definitely worth seeking out the sort of the real story because the the employers will tell you everything's fine and everyone comes in on this visa and it's no problem but um yeah uh, yeah ask questions and and do research definitely important that that actually brings you on nicely to to my next question max which i'll ask you first as well since you touched on it is what what would you say you, you were obviously quite excited about going to china you, you say you did your degree so that you'd be able to get the tefl and and go to to china after um but what did you find was the difference between the reality of what it was like once you got there and your expectation of what it would be like and what what i guess were the what was your initial experience like what were you doing uh what bits of it had you maybe not anticipated or not thought about that you either loved or found challenging um, and how did you find it kind of socially in terms of integrating into the city, meeting people and, and kind of getting scripts to the city, particularly because um, I don't think you didn't speak Mandarin when, when you arrived, right? So you didn't have mm -hmm. language skills. Um, so yeah, how did you find it? I mean, if I'm honest, it was the time of my life. It was absolutely everything I thought it was going to be and more. It was just incredible. Um, because I'd been so into the idea of moving to China for so long, I'd watched every YouTube video, I'd watched every documentary, I'd read every forum post. And then when, you, when I got there, all the things I had heard about were more intense than I imagined them to be, which I found to be mean that they were more interesting and more exciting. On the reverse side of that, some people that I worked with and lived with the intensity of some of the realities of living in China caught them by surprise. And, you know, that was a negative, you know, maybe they thought, oh, the pollution isn't going to be that bad. And then, you know, circa 2015, I'm sure you remember, Rich, it's much better now, but the pollution was unbelievable. You can taste it. It's, it's, you know, it's 
stronger than you can even imagine BBC News gives it credit for. Um, so yeah, in my experience, everything was just a bit more intense than I imagined. Um, but you know, I'd been to China before, so maybe I sort of expected things a bit. In terms of sort of social life, um, there were no problems there um, because I went with a big company which brought in a big intake of, I think like 12 of us at the same time from North America and the UK. So we had this two week onboard training. And back in those days, you had to do a China TEFL um, when you first arrived in China, which I'm pretty sure they discontinued, but it's just a sort of extra qualification to get your visa. And our teacher was a Canadian woman who just finished a year teaching in Pyongyang, North Korea, which I thought was the coolest thing ever, that that could be an option to live in North Korea. <laughs> Um, I thought, wow, this is amazing. But um, through that kind of experience, we all became really close. And, you know, I ended up living with people from that onboarding course. Um, and Beijing has a great expat community. You know, you walk into any bar in central Beijing and you're going to make friends. It's not like Tokyo where everyone's kind of a bit meaner, you know. So, yeah, socially speaking, yeah, not a problem. If you're young and happy and up for a laugh. Nice, thanks, Max. And Claudia, you, you obviously you went at a slightly different time in, in life. You'd, you'd been working with the, the Lib Dems for, for a bit of time um, before then deciding that you wanted to, to go abroad and, and to teach. How, how did you find doing it at that, that different point in life? And how did you find the reality versus expectation of your first um, jobs abroad were? Um, well, I'd, I'd always wanted to, to travel and I just wanted to work for a bit in the UK to save up the money to be able to, to take that leap. And then I did a, did a sort of Southeast Asian backpacking trip and then had to come back to London to make, make more money. And I thought, well, what can I do to make this lifestyle more sustainable? Um, and I, and that, and that's what, what led me to TEFL really, because I thought, well, then I can live abroad and work abroad and, 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 and travel. And, and rather than just keep coming back to London, making the money and then spending it abroad, it would, it would be a much, much better way of doing it. And 10 years down the line, I'm still, I'm still doing that, but, uh, but in a different way, because I'm doing it online now. Um, but it was, it was, it was useful to have that, that initial experience and, and to know that if I wanted to have that London life that I could, I could go back to it. And I, um, for, for years after leaving the, the party, I still got emails from them asking me to come back and asking me to work, especially on by-election campaigns, because whenever an MP dies or resigns, there's like this two month really intense campaign and they need to recruit someone quickly. So they always thought, oh, well, Claude might be available. Um, and, and normally I was sort of the other side of the world and, and, and said no. Um, but it's just good to have a few more options. So yeah, it's been good, good to have that. Nice, and, and Shah, how did you find the reality was versus your expectation and how did you find it kind of socially integrating into a, a new city? You, you'd obviously been learning the language um, a bit at that point and, and were wanting to use it, but did you find that you needed to be able to speak Spanish or, or did you find that you could have got by without it as well? No, I think I think I sort of I really wanted to learn Spanish. I really wanted to do it at GCSE. I let it go, and I thought oh, I've got a great opportunity here. I don't think it was necessary. It definitely wasn't needed. It's definitely quite a fun thing when you first go into your your lessons. I remember they would sort of some of them were were talking, and there'd be a word that I'd pick up, and I'd be like, I'd say like, I don't know what you're saying, and they would kind of be a bit thrown by it. So it was more like a kind of I used it a bit more to my advantage when they thought I was just you know I couldn't speak the language at all. I could understand some bits. Um, no, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a word that they use to describe Buenos Aires, uh, and it's like a phrase they use all the time. It's kikilombo, and it basically is a word that can't be translated into English. It's like a whirlwind and a nightmare at the same time. Not in a horrendous way, but in like, um, it's this melting pot. It is like the busiest place I have ever been in my life. It's um, chaotic, it's exciting, they're really passionate. And it was a bit of a shock, you know, coming just being this like, British British girl and sort of arriving and I had a friend 
obviously a mutual friend of ours who was living there and he kind of showed me the ropes, which was great. But I have to be honest, I think I would have, I think I would have been okay anyway. It was at a time in my life I really wanted that kind of excitement and passion. And, and Buenos Aires was definitely the place that sort of, um, you know, did it for me. Um, the lessons were a bit, you know, like I said, it was kind of evening class here, morning class here. Some days the, the class would be cancelled and I wouldn't know until I arrived. So it was, I don't think being being nearly 30 like the age I'm now I don't you know I'm slightly more organized especially being a primary school teacher I'm a bit more I need to know but at that time in my life it really it really excited me and I was able even if the the, the class was cancelled and there would just be a sign saying Serrano closed you would just like be able to you know wander have a great time I would also sometimes just walk into other you know teaching schools and just say like if you have a class I remember I got a couple of classes just um completely randomly and they just you know paid me for the hour and you know like I said the checks weren't great so um you know places like China it will be more um it will be more structured um or any you know other places like Russia and things like that um but yeah the course the course itself doing tap it was very very well organized at St George's um, International um they really taught a lot about the pedagogy like how to teach and that wasn't as useful when I was in Buenos Aires, but actually proved to be extremely useful when I did my PGC. So having this TEFL not only was amazing, but it was amazing because I got to go to Argentina and I got to live there and I didn't have to come back because I didn't have any money. But it was the, the PGC, you know, being able to remember certain things I've been taught about different learners and how people, you know, cognitive behavioral ther and cognitive um, load therapy and things like that I was like oh this is interesting because when I did the PGC I thought oh I've, I've, I've I remember this I remember this from the TEFL um so that would be kind of uh yeah how useful it was um and and, and possible uh challenges when I was there but I did absolutely love it yeah just to to linger on the, on the teaching a bit more I think that's often something which which a, a lot of people are, are kind of anxious about before they go because I think a lot of people who go and, and want to do TEFL abroad uh, and maybe like you were saying you were Max you, you weren't really into the teaching you just wanted to get abroad and this was a great way of doing that um, and and it seemed like a fun interesting way of doing it but um, Shah perhaps stay with you what what tips would you have for somebody who's who's not done teaching before they may be doing a TEFL course which um, maybe does a lot of the theory but it, it's not it's not like being in the classroom and, and having lots of, of experience in that way um, maybe initially um, so how did you find it when you were first kind of thrown into the classroom? What tips would you have for people to kind of prepare for if they're going out, out to teach? And, and what about it is it that you, you love so much that you've ended up staying and teaching and going into the PG um, C and why, why do you kind of recommend teaching as, as a good career option? Um, I think that the, you know, I guess maybe the challenge is sort of in a, in a you know, post-COVID world is I don't know how much of it is, is online, but the intensive course I did was kind of eight to four every day and they teach you, I mean, I think teaching is one of those things, it's, it's, it's about like work, you know, it's such a personable job, you're working all the time with people and it's, it's, you, you get a lot of like, um, on the course, I got a lot of nurture about how you speak to people and the best way to, you know, how people are going to receive information and it was very kind of, it was very hands on and I definitely enjoyed that aspect of sort of, you know, being with people watching their journey and especially because it was through the month um, and I just love just love talking to people and I loved um, that kind of it does sound really really cheesy but that there are often light bulb moments for people regardless of their age and what they're learning where they're like oh wait no no I, I get it now I get it and then they apply it and particularly when you're doing the TEF form when someone's been struggling particularly with something and then they get it and they're having an amazing conversation and that you just see them oh god it sounds so cheesy you see them light up and you think oh my oh my god I've been part of that process and it was really that that kind of did it for me and made me think as a career teaching is what I want to do um primary school purely because I just love I love kids um and yeah that that light bulb moment it is a you know it is a fantastic job it's it's a very demanding job um you know you are you are on from the minute those children come in all the way but that's when you put on holiday so you can uh you can relax in that time and have some new time uh but yeah definitely that interpersonal connection with people and watching them get it you know however long that process is and that's what inspired me to um to, to get into teaching 
Hey, thank you. Claudia, I asked the kind of same question to you, but maybe the slightly different start, uh, slant of, you, you've obviously taught in, in lots of different countries, lots of different environments. Um, how have you found that transition between going to different um, countries and maybe having to, to teach within different cultural contexts or different ages of students and all of those kind of things? And how have you found the transition from teaching offline to maybe on, mainly online? Do you have any tips for students about kind of key things to think about if teaching online? Because I think a lot of people at the moment are starting their teaching careers online, which can be quite daunting in, in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my in-person teaching was mainly sort of teaching groups, but my online teaching has been has been one to one. Um, and I find one to one teaching really rewarding because I can all my lessons are really tailored to my my students level and to their needs. And I sort of carved a bit of a niche for myself in exam prep, um, especially IELTS preparation. I mainly work with Russian speakers and Arabic speakers, but not only. Um, and just to echo what what Charlotte was saying, really, is it's it's so rewarding when the student sends you an email and say, I've got my result and I'm I'm on my way to get my visa for Canada or for Australia and they go on to, to do their degree or, or, or complete their immigration process. And I've got I've got students in those countries that still write to me and still still remember the preparation we we did together. And that's that's what makes it all worthwhile. And and like Max, you know, I kind of it was just a means to an end to travel, but it has become become so much more than that for me. So it's been brilliant. Um, one one bit of feedback that I always get from my online students is that they're really happy um, that I error correct them and they say a lot of a lot of teachers don't. So I think having some kind of error correction technique, which you can use with groups or with individuals, is really important. Um, don't don't be afraid to correct people. It's your, that's your job, you know, but do it, you know, do it nicely. Um, but, but that people do want that. So so give them that is a big tip, I think um and culturally it has been um it has been very different the, the two regions i've mainly worked with and there were a lot more culture shocks working in the arab world than work, working in in russia my my family background's polish so being in the kind of slavo sphere wasn't too much of a of a shock for me um but but especially in libya i worked with some very 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 conservative students um and luckily i had a really supportive boss it was he was a libyan but he 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 worked in in the states for many years so he was very open-minded and he really supported me when i had some moments where i was like i don't know what to do because i had students that you know we were following western textbooks but we had to adapt them to the cultural context because i had students that would refuse to listen to music um because they thought it was an islamic so um, according to their interpretation. So I had to say, hi guys, I'm gonna play some music in five minutes. If you'd like to leave the classroom, um, you can do so and you can come back in, in, in 10 minutes. And, and some of them chose to, to do that. So um, it was great to have a boss that said, you know, don't change your teaching style, just give people the option because not everybody feels that way. You know, if everybody feels that way, then obviously you can't do it. But if it's just a minority, then then adapt and ask them to adapt as well. Um, but that was something that I never, I don't know, it's just something you don't think of, is it? It's it's really, it's really different. Um, I had I had one student that refused to look at me and um and spent the entire time staring at the desk like this. Um and I and I actually said that I couldn't I couldn't teach him. So I had my I had my red line because I said I I, I, I teach in a way that's interactive. I want to move my students around. I want them to do group work. I want them to do pair work. And I need, I need to speak to my students. So if my student won't look at me, then I can't, I can't teach them. And they did, they, they, they asked them to find another institute. So it was really, but without, that, without the support of my manager, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I'm very grateful for him. Yeah, so it's, it's always interesting how Particularly, I think teaching, because as, as you're saying, Shara, it's such a like personable, um, interactive way of working. You learn so much about 
what say cultural differences which you might have read about or heard about you really see how they actually play out in in practice and what they really mean and, and how much they they matter to people through through that teaching um max did you have any tips for for teaching or anything you want to share on that point um well uh, off the back of uh what claudia said about the the sort of cultural awareness that is something that caught me by surprise when I started teaching. Um, I kind of warmed to teaching quite quickly. It suited my personality. I'm quite good at public speaking and stuff like that, like quite confident. Um, but there was a few things I can't remember. I had, this was my the first time I had parents in the class. And um, on the big whiteboard at the front of the class, I was writing everyone's name. And to make it kind of more beautiful i i wrote everyone's name in alternating colors but i wrote one of the students names in red which i had no idea is a really big cultural no-no in china is to write someone's name in red it's like a big sort of disrespect it, i think it, it leads back to the days of plague or something um i'm sure richard would know more about the history but um Anyway, the, the, the mother got really upset and I kind of had a whisper in my ear <laughs> midway through my first open lesson. You shouldn't write the names in red. It's really rude in China. And I was like, oh my God, I had to make up an excuse to change all the names. That ruined my lesson plan. Um, that actually uh, brings me on to something that is important. When you start teaching, your bosses will be really strict about your lesson plan which is good in the long run. But what a lot of uh, managers and uh, teacher trainers don't tell you is that if you stress out about time management too much, it will completely ruin your class. Um, I'm sure you guys have all experienced it where you've gone five minutes over the intro and that's eating into the first game. And then you have like a manager nodding and like checking her watch at the back of the classroom. And you're like, I can't handle this, oh my God. <laughs> Um, yeah, that happened a few times, but you, you, you soon realize that it doesn't actually matter. Um, they've just got a couple of boxes to tick and you're kind of, you have to bear the brunt of that. But um, yeah, cultural awareness is a big one though. Uh, make sure you read the entire Wikipedia entry for the, the country you're going to, because you don't want any surprises. <laughs> Max and, and Koda, you, you've obviously, you mentioned at the start that you've you've moved beyond teaching in a way, Claudio doing proofreading and other translation work. Uh, Max, you've started helping with kind of curriculums and content writing um, and that kind of thing. How, how, how have you found that transition from, from being all about teaching in the classroom to, to doing other work? How helpful have you found TEFL to be for finding other jobs that are either related or, or unrelated? And, and why you both obviously stayed abroad for a long period of time. Why, why have you, um, why, why do you enjoy that lifestyle so much? Particularly Claudia with your um, quite digital, no, digitally nomadic, you're teaching online and you can go and live in different countries, travel a lot. Um, what is it about you that really, about that lifestyle that really um, keeps you going with it? And, and what maybe do you find to be the challenges? That's Claudia, if you could go first. Um... Yeah, no, Temple's helped helped immensely with the more recent work I've been doing with proofreading and translation because a lot of my work is looking at things that non-native speakers have written in English. And because I've looked at lots of students' work over the years, I kind of know what they want to say, but I know how to rephrase it in a more natural way. And I found that work mainly through a platform called Fiverr.com, which is a big freelance platform. Um, and um, also from from students as well, um, and it's been nice. It's been nice to do something a little bit different from teaching. Up, have having been in it for some time, so it just kind of keeps me keeps things fresh and keeps things new. And and I get such diverse work from it that I find it really rewarding. So I do a lot of um, check a lot of CVs. I've had a lot of really interesting CVs from people applying to be astronauts, people from applying to be to work for the UN and other international institutions and I worked for some Baltic startups as well which has been really interesting and do some 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 proofreading work for a 
the Turkish lady for her blog. So it's just really diverse and it just, it's just a bit different from just doing lots and lots of exam prep, which is still my bread and butter, but does get a bit samey after a while. Um, so that's been great. And my kind of big hobby um, and, and big passion in life has been language learning. So by focusing on different and, and, and living in different regions, I've been able to to learn to learn Spanish and Arabic and, and Russian. And that's been that's been a big motivator for me. And also just just to keep to keep traveling and to and to travel to remoter places that, like I said before, you wouldn't necessarily be able to find very lucrative jobs in. But by working online, I can still travel there and still make it sustainable, which has been the goal all along. Great, thank you. Um, just before Max asks you the, the same question, if, if anybody um, watching has any questions like to ask after this, we will be going to, to any audience questions. So feel free to put those in the chat or you can put the little hand up icon um, if you want to, to kind of unmute, put your video on and, and ask the question directly. Um, so do start putting any questions you have, have in the chat. Um, but yeah, Max, how, how have you found that transition from from teaching to to doing more content and curriculum work and and what's what's making you want to to stay abroad and keep traveling um so you know i'm still very much in the process of making that change you know half my schedule is still teaching um so you know that's kind of the beauty of tefl is when you're going into another element of tefl wherever you are in the world you are still going to find the occasional teaching job to float you while you try to pursue a different option. So I've basically just really cut down my teaching hours to free up space for me to um, to do this content creation stuff that I really want to do. Um, and you know, when you're working sort of freelance teaching, I guess you can choose your own rate. So you're getting paid more per hour than well, in my case, than I was when I was full time. So it sort of all balances out quite nicely. Um, so uh, Claudia mentioned um, she's using a app or a website, Fiverr at the moment. And um, for me, currently, I'm just doing projects for schools that I've worked with before or for schools that are friends of people I've worked with before, you know, still through sort of word of mouth. Um, but the the kind of beauty that I've seen of it already is that I'm just so much more in control of my schedule than I was when I was a full time teacher. And um, I was very lucky last year that my school didn't make any cuts because of COVID. But a lot of people um, in Japan and in China and I'm sure elsewhere, they lost work, they lost their livelihoods completely during coronavirus because when schools moved to online they didn't need as many teachers or you know the english program was cut or whatever um i was very lucky but it was sort of a wake-up call that i need to diversify my my cv a bit and um now that i've got sort of multiple jobs and multiple projects going on um i'm more confident that when uh the next global catastrophe occurs <laughs> I'll hopefully have something in my resume that I can pull out, you know, if the, if the next calamity does sort of take out English teaching completely, as this very well could have. Um, so yeah, transitions are always difficult and stressful. Doing it abroad has extra problems, because in Japan, they're very keen on paperwork. Everyone thinks Japan is really futuristic. It's not. Everything's fax machines, stamps, sign it, sign it again, go to this municipal office, get it signed again. Nothing is digital. It's really complex um, to do the transition from being a full-time worker to part-time and freelance. Um, so it's a bit stressful, but it's worth it because I've got so much more time to myself now, um, so much more control, and I, I, I wish I did it sooner for sure. Nice. That's actually a question we've just had come in from, from Olivia um, and it relates to this. She asks, can you apply the skill of teaching using TETL in other industries 
of work uh, obviously you've all stated in teaching and you just mentioned claudia and max how you've used it to to go into other related but not not directly teaching um careers but perhaps do any of you have examples of of, of friends or other people you've seen along the way who've used it in other areas and what parts of, of doing tefl do you think are really just transferable great skills to learn and particularly in the first job um after uni I kind of leave that as a a free for all if any of you want to to jump in on it I'll jump in quickly and just say that I mean I'm I'm in contact with some of the people that I still did the um uh, the TEFL course with um and I think the thing about it and the thing we talk about teaching in general is you do learn a lot about yourself and like Claudia was saying like her, her boundaries like where she was prepared to go and you it's a very um, it's like quite a self-reflective job because you're recognizing like, you know, things like your behavior management strategy, your um, how much workload you can take on, how do you approach people, how do you nurture and care for these people, are, are you nurturing caring, like can, do you then figure out, oh actually it's not, it's not necessarily for me, so it's a very, you, found, you find out a lot about yourself and your, yeah, your own ability but also your what you what you like and what you don't like because you're kind of you give yourself a lot to, to to the students that you're teaching so I think you know I don't directly know of any stories but I know that some of the people that I that I did tackle with they've gone into um, a range of different things like you know journalism um, one of them went back into is like a, an account manager because through the course they just worked out what it is that they wanted so it was a kind of sounding board for them um, so yeah, I would say it's a it's a very it was a very formative time for me and for others that did it to work out what it is that they that they like doing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's one of the main things that that I've seen with with lots of friends who've done TEFL, particularly straight after uni, is it's just a great way to to get off the kind of conveyor belt through jobs that you often find yourself on when you're as you're graduating uni, you feel like you've got to get into a grad scheme or into whatever X, Y, Z type of job straight away. But TEFL is a great way to go and do something completely different, take a step back, think about what actually you enjoy doing, what matters to you, all whilst learning a lot of transferable skills, whilst having a great experience, uh, visiting a new country and often earning quite well as well. Um, so it's just a really great way if, you, if you're not sure what you want to do to take that step back and to 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 think about it um, a bit more. Um, I don't know, Max or Claudia, if you have anything you you want to add on 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 that point. Uh, sorry, Claudia. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, we were sort of saying this before the session started. Um, just the fact that it takes you abroad is one of the best skills it gives you. Um, you know, very common in any job, people will ask you, you know, um, how confident are you working with new teams, working with new projects, working with new management? If you've left the country you were raised in, moved to the other side of the world to a culture and language totally alien to you, you know, moving jobs is going to be easy. And um, a great skill you pick up as well is, um, sort of uh, team management when you've got you know often in the the china cases you'll have the chinese staff and you'll have the foreign staff and a lot of your job if you uh move into a position of management is being a liaison between the two uh groups or the three groups of the marketing staff the teaching staff the training staff and these are all skills that i'm sure you can use in in a wide range of industry, especially as most industries now are internationally minded. So if you have that international experience and that experience with kind of cross cultural communication, it's going to be hugely beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say something very similar, actually, and also just a sort of tip to join various sort of expat expat groups and network through them when you are in country because you through them through those groups you end up meeting people that aren't in TEFL and you just see what else is out there and you know if you speak to the right person you might end up being offered a, a, a job there and, and you don't know where that will lead to and I was 
in Libya, I joined a group called I Will, which was International Women in Libya, um, which had this whole whole diverse range of of women, um, including women that were married to, to Libyan men and Filipino nurses, many of which I'm still in touch with now and, and, and women investing and women doing all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so it was just, just, just a great, great way of seeing what else was out there in, in Saudi. Internations was very, was very active as a group and they've got branches all over all over the world, it's a bit more formal and a bit more networky. Um, and in a, in, a, in a funner sense, there's also Couchsurfing, which is a great resource to use, um, which may not necessarily lead to work, but certainly leads to really interesting connections and is a, is a, is a great way of, of meeting locals as well, which is also really important. So I feel like I end, I end every, uh, every one of these um, these events with a shout out for couch surfing and work away but they really are great ways to to meet new people travel cheaply have different fun experiences so if you haven't used them before couch surfing and work away very very much recommend um i think that's we've gone slightly over time and uh, i think that's about all we've got time for today but thank you so much max Shah and claudia that's really informative and i feel very inspired to go and, and live in a new country now um, particularly buenos aires and i've, I've it would have been fascinating to be in Libya back in uh, back then. And probably now's not not the best time to to be shooting over there. But um, but yeah, thank you all so much. Um, that that was really really brilliant. Um, and if anybody watching has has any further questions, feel free to to email those to to us at recruitment at go two dot co. Um, I'd be very happy to get back to you. And I'll put some links in the chat now as well if you're interested in going to China next summer to, to earn your TEFL and, and to explore the country, um, then we will be having our programs in China in summer 2022. Um, and if you want to move to China to teach, um, then you can register for our China Fellowship Program, which we're now expecting um, to welcome our first cohort onto after the Winter Olympics, which are in Beijing um, in February 2022. Um, but we'll email you if you register when applications open. So I put those links in the chat um, so feel free to email or get in touch. But thank you, Matt, Claudia, and Shah, um, and hope everybody has a lovely afternoon or evening where you are, Max. Uh, yes, it's uh, yeah half ten for me here in Tokyo. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you. It's been brilliant. Very Cheers, much. Rich. Richard, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.